Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Chi Johnson and I am the brand and communications manager here at Intellum. Our team of award-winning customer education professionals help the largest and fastest moving brands in the entire world successfully educate their customers, partners, and employees. We are the disruptors, the innovators, the doers, and the creators. And for over 22 years, we have been observing and rethinking how people learn and collaborate. Organizational education is a practical solution to a lot of issues that organizations face with retention, revenue, and achieving crucial business outcomes. What we've recognized is that it can often feel very, very complicated, but that's why we're here and tell them is here to help. This webinar series underscore is our way of providing more insight into what customer education and organizational education is and can be. We prop up our experts and our partners to share their knowledge and practical advice right here inside of the Intellum platform. Today, we are presenting securing a certification program with online proctoring. We're going to explore the myriad of ways that remote online proctoring adds value, security, and scalability, remember that word, to your certification or education program. So I am super excited about this topic because I get to hang with these two friends. We, I'm not going to introduce them today. I'm going to let them introduce themselves, but we are joined today by our very own, and tell them's very own, Chief Experience Officer, Greg Rose, and our special guests with our partners, Honor Lock, Steve Roper, who is the VP of Corporate. So let's start first with Greg. I'd love for you to introduce yourself. Steve, you can go after, and we can dive right into this awesome content. Hey everybody, I'm Greg. I'm the CXO at Intellum. That is a very fancy title. It really just means that I own a big chunk of the of the customer journey from the point at which we're meeting people for the first time all, all the way through the point at which we're we're engaged in in solutioning both new initiatives and then maybe helping to figure out how to boost existing initiatives. So I get to work with customers, different parts of the journey. It's actually a really wonderful job. My background is in marketing and then in some sales and growth stuff through some support stuff and how I've kind of got this this whole picture. So if you're ever interested in that role, you might be crazy to want to have it. But if you are interested, I'd love to to talk about what I think it, it really is. So feel free to hit me up, talk about CXO stuff. It's really interesting, but that's me. Well, thanks, Greg. So my name is Steve Roper. So I am the VP of corporate at Honor Lock and Really, my, my view of the world is more focused on taking the existing honor lock solutions, which have been deployed very successfully in the world of higher education, and then applying it to so the, corporate, the corporate or the enterprise world. And so there are a number of very interesting use cases that, that we believe are enabled. I have a long history in technology. I won't bore you with all the details, but suffice to say that I've been in JIC sales and business development for decades <laughs> and we'll leave it at that. Thank you. Oh, good. I'll, I'll drag us right into the, the conversation. And I, she did a little bit as the beginning. I'm going to, I'm going to kind of take a couple of steps back and do a bit of a shameless plug, but it gives us some context for today's session. Intellum is the leader in ed tech for business. Now, what, what that means is that we've got 22 years of experience solving complex education and technical solutions for clients. Now, what all of that really means is that we work with, with organizations of all shapes and sizes, engaging every audience they touch from, from customers to partners and employees. And a good bit of that work includes certification programs. So organizations today on our platform are certifying a wide range of audiences, again, across that entire customer, partner, and employee spectrum. A lot of those, those clients are certifying all of those audiences on our platform from a single instance. There's some really large certifications. There's some small scrappy ones. We've got, we've got kind of a, a wide range. The impetus to actually build the customer education solution was born out of a, a large global high stakes certification program. So today we're gonna discuss all the varying shapes and sizes of cert certification programs, the complexity of these programs and, and how many organizations are including proctoring as part of that certification strategy and why. But over the last several years, we've worked closely with one modern, 
progressive, efficient, powerful, futuristic AI proctoring solution, that's HonorLock. So what's fascinating to me about the HonorLock and Intellum story is the same way that Intellum was sort of born from the fires of, of enterprise education, HonorLock was born in the complex world of, of higher ed and academics, which I think introduces a sense of credibility to the concept and the solution because of where, where Honor Lock comes from. So I'd love for Steve, for you to take a, a few minutes and walk the audience through kind of the trajectory of Honor Lock. Well, yeah, thank you, Greg. So I think one of the compelling things about Honor Lock as a company is that we were actually started by students, right? We were started by students that had been going to school. They entered an entrepreneurship, the concept specifically with the, the objective of fixing this online assessment problem as they saw it. They actually won the, the contest. They got a modest stipend for that and then reinvested those dollars right into setting about talking to a variety of stakeholders on campus to sort of figure out how, to, how could they make this process better. That is essentially the origin story of our company because that what turned out to be that product, right, that process is really now the foundation of our company moving forward. So we were essentially started by people that had some skin in the game, so to speak, and they solved the problem, right? So today, Onalock is a much more mature company. And what we actually effectively do is combine both a, an AI front end in concert with proctors and customer support teams to ensure the best proctoring experience possible, not only for the administrator, which could be in the higher ed world, a, a professor or a provost, but also for the student or the test taker. Because as everyone knows, when you have to take an exam, typically there's some anxiety, maybe if you haven't studied as much as you should have. So we train our teams to, to really sort of tamp down the anxiety and, and help the, the test taker sort of get through the process. And so that sort of market acceptance of, of how we deploy our overall solution is referenced on this slide, right? So there are a number of the country's largest, most diverse colleges and universities that are actually using Honorlog solutions today. I'm a big fan of this slide because, and I don't want to bore you with a bunch of sort of macroeconomic issues, but this slide really speaks to the fact that there's a lot going on in the marketplace right now. And it really doesn't matter where you are sort of in the, in, in the equation. There's just incremental market complexity. So we are squarely in the era of what we call digital transformation right now. It's the same thing that Mark Benioff refers to as the fourth industrial revolution. So there's an immense amount of energy, both financial and time, and et cetera, just resources going into moving us into more of an online world. So when you think about some just incredibly pedestrian applications like signing contracts, that process of moving from paper and pen to sort of digital signing, that is a billion dollar a year business. I mean, so so if you just think about just that one activity, which has effectively been moved to the, the online world, think about all of the other scenarios, right, where over time we are going to start to see more and more progression and transition and complexity. And unfortunately, for some, it will mean stress. So hopefully we will be able to impart some, some experience and wisdom today to help you in your journeys. And so here's another example, which I love, and I I use this with my kids. So I have a cork board on my board on my wall. Well, in today's language, that is Pinterest. Pinterest is a $15 billion market cap company. You literally cut their teeth on moving sort of like a 20th century thing to the 21st century, right? There, there are a there are such a, a wide range of other applications and use cases and what have you to be affected. And so one of one of the one of my favorite that I that I like to talk about is the DMV experience. I don't know that I've ever heard anyone talk about wanting to go to the Department of Motor Vehicles and sit down and actually take a written test in advance of actually taking their driver's test. Yeah. From 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 my perspective, that just that that very process which which is high stakes because you're driving around town in a 4000 pound vehicle. But but no one wants to go to the DMV. Like 
like exams like that, and like there are others, right? Like think about all the certifications you might need to get like at the state level to be a teacher or a doctor or a lawyer or a realtor or what have you. All of those assessments and exams will eventually wind up. And so, and so we, we, so we kind of feel like we are in concert, right? We are philosophically aligned. Honor Lock is philosophically aligned with, with our friends at Intella in an effort to try to help the folks with whom we engage, help them get there in a much more methodical fashion so that it doesn't turn out to be a fire drill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I should point out here because I, I didn't do it a bit earlier, but we work together on some of our large clients, some of Intellum's large clients, including some of our big tech brands are already here. They're using this solution today to, to, to manage and monitor their large high stakes global certification programs. So we can get in a little bit more in a minute about what that means. Uh, to, to Steve's point on the business side of the fence, if the historical, if the higher ed space that Honor Lock traditionally played before kind of jumping over our side of the fence and getting more engaged, the, uh, what we know on the business side is the actual value of the educated user. So I think intrinsically, everyone knows that a, an educated user or a, a customer, a partner, an employee is valuable. We, we, we know that. What many, what many companies struggle with is not being able to identify or get their hands around what that value is, and much less are they able to manufacture it. However, organizations with mature education initiatives are able to correlate the consumption of content at the individual user level, again, through customers and partners and employees. They're able to, to correlate the consumption of that content to business performance. That means th these companies can tell you on average how much more money an educated customer will spend than an uneducated one. So from partners to customers to employees, these mature initiatives lead directly to things like increased usage and utilization An experienced program owner can actually create initiatives that increase revenue or address some business issues like decreasing costs through support, which is something we see fairly often. If structured education initiatives, then structured education initiative can make a big impact on business performance. The question is, do all structured education initiatives actually require Proctor? And to answer that question, I think we first have to sort of define certification. So we were getting at this a little bit during the warm up. We we have a, a a blog post actually on the site called certifications. I think it's why you should or should not offer them. I'll ask Chi to drop the the link in the chat so people can go kind of dig into what I'm about to say a little bit deeper. But there's really sort of three levels of reward that we have to consider. I, I think a lot of things are called certifications that probably shouldn't be. There are general awards, which are often delivered through an education platform in the form of like a point system or badges, for example. These are things that people receive for completing an activity or a course. They're focused on engagement. They're keeping the learner progressing through the content and coming back to the initiative. There are certificates, which are, are usually aligned with lower stakes initiatives, where you're, you're is issuing a document that says that someone has completed something, or maybe they're getting a, cert a certificate of participation. And, and while a certification could actually include a certificate. I don't mean, mean to suggest it can't, but a, a professional certification attests that an individual has demonstrated proficiency mm -hmm. in competencies that indicate they can perform a job or a task to the expectations. That is a really complicated definition, but it is, it is the best definition of a certification. And the only way to measure this proficiency then is through evaluation that's usually in the form of an assessment. So when we look at the customers on, that are doing this well on our platform to achieve scale, she said, remember the word scale, we'll talk a good bit about scale. Many organizations certify these individuals using digital certification assessments, which are then delivered through the platform. So now that we've sort of defined a high stakes certification as the actual assessment, 
that follows the consumption of the curriculum that's leading the individual user to mastery. The next logical question for me is like, why should we do proctoring and, and for whom? And I think Steve is going to answer that question for us. <laughs> you know what? I will, I, I will attempt to, to provide you with some perspective because we've, we've, we've certainly talked about this in the past. So, so there's a, a Sometimes there's consternation right around when we should deploy certain solutions to meet certain objectives. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that the world is just almost exponentially more complex than it was even two years ago. So we, we have the pre-pandemic world and we have the world in which we, we now live. And on the, on the higher ed side of things, there are some changes and modifications that had to happen. But in the world of business, in the world of enterprise, many of those same changes have, have happened, but now we're actually not necessarily going back to where we were. So there were a number of companies, for example, that I'm not going to go into specific names, but there were a lot of companies that said, okay, everyone, you get to go home now and work from home. And so now that we're sort of on the, on the other side of the pandemic, now the companies have said, all right, everyone come back to the office. And a lot of people have responded with, yeah, that doesn't work for me anymore. So as a result, companies are now having to flex a bit more, right? To try to address the needs of their employees, their single largest asset to then handle like the new world of, of work that in which we now find ourselves. So in the world of higher ed, there's, there's call it less big ticket study hall exam taking going on. And in the world of enterprise, there is there are fewer people driving, doing the, the daily commute to the office or mm. driving many hours to like the nearest testing facility so that they can take a certain certification exam. So with that world clearly changing as a, as a business owner, how do you address like this new changing world, right? And so as you continue, for example, to educate your employees, right? Or if you want to certify your developer community, that the way in which you do that now has to sort of flex to deal with the new demands of the marketplace. And so you know, I think more than anything, a good rule of thumb, and Greg spoke to this in, really in a previous slide, the higher the stakes, the higher the probability that those exams or assessments should be proctored. We can, and later on, we can, you can just freestyle a little bit about different market segments that, that make sense, but there is, mm -hmm. there is some that really lend themselves to higher stakes testing that where the truth be told lives are on the line. So those people that perform service in that world really need to know what they, what they're doing. So anyways, and I think Greg, one of the, one of the things that we previously talked about was kind of like this aha moment, right? Yeah. That you had. Yeah. Um, yeah, and feel My, free. I mean, I, yeah, I can, I, I can say it and you can tell people what it means. I mean, I, I thought of proctoring solely through the lens of real time learner by learner cheating mitigation. That, that, that's what I thought of as proctoring. And when I, I saw clients and organizations implementing proctoring solutions or, or utilizing proctoring solutions, that was my assumption. That's only part of the picture. And I think what I've learned working with Honor Lock is where another benefit of proctoring comes in that's equally as important, if not more important. And I'll let you, you, Steve, kind of define that and describe it. But it really wasn't a big aha moment for me. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So this, this slide really speaks to sort of a concept that as I am a visual person, so I'd like to see diagrams and pictures and whatnot. In, in my own mind, I thought about this continuum of proctoring, right? Where all the way on one side, you'd have automated solutions, typically AI-based, et cetera. All the way on the other side of the continuum are live proctors, right? So 100% live individuals engaging with exam takers one-on-one. -on -one. And then in the middle, you actually have a hybrid solution. And really that is actually where Honor Lock resides. So our solution, mm -hmm. I spoke to it a little bit earlier, but I'll just kind of reinforce it. It is a combination of sort of AI technology on the front end in concert with people on the back end who perform the customer service and proctoring function. And what we have found, and we've received a lot of sort of positive reinforcement in the market that this hybrid solution is, is 
in many cases, sort of the best case scenario in, in having to work through how do you how do you proctor an assessment with the with sort of the proctor or the process of proctoring really being defined as sort of a neutral third party, essentially validating that the test taker is in fact who they're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And the both both the test taker and the environment is free from like disruption or other things that might impede or prevent the validity of the assessment from moving forward. So, so on the automated side of things, as I mentioned, it was typically an AI for an end, which on the pro side is obviously technology is always available and it scales, which is good news, right? The downside is that AI is really what we have found to be only a part of the overall or a complete solution. And goodness knows there are many big name, multi-billion dollar, actually multi-trillion dollar tech firms who have all yeah. made multi-billion dollar investments in AI, but guess what? It's still not there. And so, so that said, because AI is, is somewhat limited, right? It will only catch certain things. So ultimately what we then need to then lean on is the potential to do like a review process if possible, which can take a ton of time, et cetera, et cetera. So the live proctoring side of things is really intended to be a one-to-one -one relationship, right? Where a person on the proctoring side literally observes a person on the test taking side during that process of taking an exam. And if they need to, they can communicate. That's great. The downside is that people as the product, so to speak, can only scale so much, right? So one of the big issues here is that you actually have to schedule these exams, right? And then in that process, if, if, you're, if you're an enterprise and you have a large number of people that need to take a certain type of exam at around the same time, this can now stress the proctoring system because you literally may not have enough people, right, to proctor at any one point in time. Um, I, we hear this all the time. I mean, I, yeah. a, lo a lot of the programs that, that run on our platform either still have or have traditionally relied on, on live proctoring as a, as a large as a large enterprise or even as a, a, a mid-sized company, either way, you don't have physical locations for people to attend proctored exams at scale. You have to identify a solution for that. So right. what we're talking about is sending customers or partners or employees to a destination to take an exam that has to be proctored by a live human and we got to scale that across the globe. And then, and when we get into this mode, I've watched just the complexity of, of this explode, especially as we start dealing with multiple locales and languages and geographical locations. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And ultimately, whenever you, you now have a single person associated with proctoring a single exam taker, by definition, that's actually going to be a very expensive solution. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. And then, and last but not least, just sort of in the hybrid world, and these are general benefits, but the combination of technology on the front end gives you some of the major benefits of the automated platform, which is always available. You don't have to worry so much about scheduling. And then in the end, at least for the initial sort of setup process, authentication and kind of getting the test taker started, there's a general reduction in anxiety because they're not yet sort of feeling like they're being watched. Mm. And, and, and so the, the, the other element here is that, is that once the, once the exam gets started, if the test taker has got issues, because there are actually people on the back end, both proctoring and CS, they're actually available to help the test taker with the ultimate objective of making sure that this test taker in a valid way actually achieves, achieves their objective of taking this exam. <laughs> whatever this is, at whatever level, it doesn't matter if they work for a company or the government or they're taking a midterm. That is the overarching objective. And so that is actually a large part of what drives us to do what we do in as efficient and as really human a manner as, as we possibly can. Of course, the, the, the flip side of that coin is with all of these resources, sometimes it requires time to go through yeah. post-exam review. Mm. It is one of those things. And so 
we as a company have spent years and millions of dollars organizing ourselves around this proctoring environment, which is intended to maximize success, both for the administrator and the exam taker. And so when we start to then think about things like integrity, for example, it's really intended to make sure that the integrity of the exam is maintained. And so there's this concept of maintaining academic integrity, right? Making sure that the, the test taker didn't leverage resources that weren't appropriate for use at the time of the exam. But at the same time, there's also this concept of integrity with respect to maintaining the integrity of the exam for the benefit of the administrator, right? So if you're a, for example, a, a, a big tech company and you spent many thousands of dollars developing the best possible exam to test for certain skills, right? You, you don't want that content, that information that you've just spent thousands of dollars building to escape into the wild. And so part of the equation, so to speak, is, is maintaining integrity really on both sides of the equation for, for the benefit of both parties. Because mm -hmm. By maintaining that integrity, it then logically then leads to the validity of that assessment. So that, look, if everyone knows that you, 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 you can't cheat on a particular test and the answers aren't widely available via that cottage industry, it then means that that certification that you then get at the end of the process now really actually has a lot of weight to it. Mm -hmm. People know that if you actually have the certification, you actually put the time in your stuff and you're in the best possible position to use those skills in the open market. Absolutely. And I, I, it dawns on me as we're talking about it, and I was just looking at the picture of the screen here for that, like an admin view of, of an honor lock environment. What would probably be helpful, and it, it, it just dawned on me that we, we hadn't done this yet, is, is to sort of describe, I think, for an audience, what an honor lock solution sort of looks like. So just quickly, I think for the for for the audience, imagine a user is coming in to take the assessment against the curriculum that you've presented. So they're going to become a certified user. She's going to walk us through an example of a certification program in a second and some real world concerns that that happen with these these large certifications. What I want to share with the audience is that Honor Lock is an in solution. So the user is taking the assessment. The AI is monitoring that individual user to, to, to look for signs of cheating or misconduct. Things like head movement is a good example. It can predict that something's going on. What makes Honor Lock sit in the middle, as Steve was describing, of the continuum of solutions is that if the AI identifies that a student sort of fits the profile or the learner or the test taker fits the profile for an issue, it alerts a live proctor who comes in to the screen essentially for the learner, the test taker, to assess the situation. If it's a non-issue, it's a non-issue, the student continues. If it is an issue, then it could be addressed. So you can see how that kind of leads us into the, the third part here, which is scalability. So I have watched a number of large certification initiatives, and I should one more time clarify that. The, the, the size of the certification is not directly correlated to the size of the organization. I know some small startups that have massive certification programs that work really well. What I've noticed about certification programs, even mature ones, is that they struggle to introduce proctoring. So if, if, if part of the value prop for proctoring is integrity and validity, which are you're protecting the integrity of the test, you're making it more valid, people understand the the value now behind it, where they struggle is around scale. So, so the worst case scenario is that you create a really great curriculum and a really valuable certification, and then you can't scale it because as people want to participate more, as it grows, you're not limited by, let's say, geographical location. So, so what I find most interesting about the Honor Lock solution compared to other proctoring solutions and, and partners we've worked with in the past is that all of a sudden there's this sort of inherent built-in scale. You can scale across total volume of users, across geographic locations, across languages and, and translations. The, the barriers that are associated with introducing live proctoring, so not just a 
an AI solution, which we all know is, is probably going to be problematic, especially at scale, but also not trying to struggle through finding a test center in South America, one in France. Oh no, now somebody's in Italy, but we don't have a test center in Italy. Like where are we going to send them? It's the wrong city. Like all of that sort of evaporates. And I think it, it becomes really powerful. The, the final point I, I want to make on benefits here too is usability. So we all think about user experience. We think about the, the, the test takers experience. It makes sense that we don't want to introduce a bunch of destinations to the user because it disrupts usability. So I don't mean just that the software, like the Intellum platform and HonorLog needs to work together seamlessly and deliver a, a great solution. That That's true. Anytime you have a an, edu an education tool and you're going to introduce a third party to like Proctoring, you want those two things to work well together. No question. I think anytime we're introducing additional destinations, whether those destinations are online, meaning I learned something here, I bounce to this other destination, maybe to take a test, maybe if there's some sort of proctoring, I have to go to a different online destination or physical destinations, like I'm studying for this exam, I want to take the certification, I wanna complete the certification tomorrow. I can't complete the certification tomorrow because the next available test is two weeks from now in a different city. That, that creates enough disruption that your certification scale, frankly, your completions are gonna tank. And we've, we've seen that time, time after time. So I think these four benefits are, are super, super important. And I think, interestingly, sort of being in the middle of the road with both the AI and the, the ability to introduce the physical is, is really, really interesting. In, in one point, I would just add, Greg, and I, and I appreciate your, your perspective there, but, but I think in a lot of respects, so coming from the tech world, you have called that one of these usability issues friction, right? Yeah, absolutely. It exists the less likely people are to do something, especially when you want or need them to do it. So absolutely, I think the key here is by making assessments available to test takers at whatever mm. time works for them. Yep, yep. And I think just a, a huge issue. And because effectively what you are, what we're doing here is we're meeting people where they are. They're, they've studied up, they're ready to go. Doesn't matter to them, to them that it's 3 a.m. right on a Saturday morning right? Like they're ready to go. We should be in a place to give them what, what it is that they need to then make the progression that they need to make. Thank you for finishing my, my thought there. It's because you did. Thank you. I, I, I sort of lost it in some other thoughts I wanted to make, but to bring that full circle for the audience, one thing I want to point out there is a really, really cool and very important. That thing that Steve just said was born out of working with students and we're applying it now to the business side, meaning over time, what Honor Log determined was that, that students take the exam when students want to take the exam. And so exam delivery isn't dependent on a, on a specific time frame. We now apply that to business. And what we're realizing is that in the same way, the people that are taking our, our business and professional certifications want to take the test, the exam. They want to complete the certification when they want to complete it. So the proctoring solution needs to meet that learner, like Steve said, where they are, so that you don't suffer the negative impact of creating friction or a roadblock, which leads to abandonment and lower engagement numbers and depletions and all that kind of stuff. So thank you, Steve. That's a really important point. And a cool example of what Honor Lock learned on the academic side that now is being applied to business. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, G. Yes, of course. So what I wanted to come in and, and say is like, so the slide is very clear, like I'm going to paint a picture. I don't want to scare you, but then like, am I? And that's also okay. I'm never going to scare you and then leave you out in the wilderness with no tools to survive. Okay. I'm not just going to leave you in the woods, Blair Witch style. So I've got this company. It's completely fictional, especially for legal reasons. Unicorn Technology Systems. If you are a regular at Underscore, you have heard about Unicorn often. They solve a lot of problems with education and they also encounter a lot of problems. And today is no... It's no exception. So they have just launched 
their PRISM certification. And so Unicorn Technology Systems has some really cool stuff, some really amazing customers, specifically ones that are that need high security clearances for the people who are working on them. So they developed a partner program. They have contractors that they have employed with their organization. So they send them out to fix their customer's stuff. So the goals of their certification program is to certify those external contractors as subject matter experts on those installed products so that when they go out to fix it, they know that they know exactly what they're doing. Their customers have confidence and the business has confidence that they're being represented well. This certification does that to make sure that they can talk the language that their employees talk and all of that. The second goal of this program is that it, they wanted to create a new revenue stream for their company. It's not a free certification. They have to pay for that. They also have to pay for it to continue to be renewed. So this is a really great example of like defining the goals of your program and then understanding how a certification program can add value to your overall organization, organizational education initiative, but to the bottom line and impacting business outcomes. Now, I want to specifically talk about the investment that goes into building CERT programs. The number of hours spent, way too many. By way too many, like from the beginning, you're like, oh, most people underestimate how many hours it's going to take to build any program, much less a certification program. So we're talking thousands of hours collectively. We're talking about team members. It's not just one person spearheading this project. It's subject matter experts. It's research people to make sure that they are getting the right information. It's the product managers. It's the technicians. It's everybody contributing to the content within this program. It's specifically the instructional designers. And if you want to look into like the bare bones of a team, what we, we have a blog actually that points to the seven people you need on your customer education team. And I actually posted it today on our LinkedIn. So sorry, slight plug there. But then let's talk about more of the investment. We're talking about a platform investment, that contract value. Let's say it's $75,000 a year for them to invest into a customer education or for this sake, a partner education program. So that's another ad there. And then their marketing spend. Once they've built the program, they have a whole go-to-market plan. They're yeah. talking... You're, you're talking about PR, you've got your ads, social ads that you, you're putting out, you've got regular SEO ads on Google search, all of these advertisements. Maybe they did outdoor, maybe they did billboards because they wanted to go right next to the where their hubs of people live. And then last but not least, influencer campaign. So they actually decided to give this program and this certification away for free to their top technicians. They're like, you know what? This is a new program. You are a top performer. We're gonna give you this certification away way for free. We just want you to tell all your other technician friends about it so that they can too. So that's what an influencer program is. And that's, they, they did that. So that's a lot of investment. Let's just say all in Greg, what, what would we, what, let's put an estimate on it. New Start. initiative starting from scratch. We factor in the value of the hours spent, the SMEs, 150,000. Okay. Steve, don't you, I think you, when we were talking, you were brainstorming, you were talking about like the number of hours or the, the value of the, depending on the hours of development. What, what is that figure? Oh, the questions, like the, the, yeah, the, the que value of the question. questions. Yeah. 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 So, so you inevitably wind up spending hundreds of dollars to pay to an SME just to develop a single question. Mm -hmm. right? So if you then multiply that, if it turns out to be a 25 or 75 or 100 question assessment, you're by definition talking about many thousands of dollars. Okay, yeah. fair. So, so now we painted a clear picture of the investment. Now is my hypothetical scenario. The, uh-oh, the risk here, I mean, this, the signal, the reason they found this out is they started to notice that time spent on that question went from 55 minutes to five minutes. And it started happening very quickly. Like it wasn't like it gradually went down. It was, it was right away. They started noticing a drop and it was quantity of the, the number of times that that happened. And that time spent on that question went down, multiplied. And they were like, wait, something's going on. And then they found out, they saw the question late. The risk here is that it creates a sense of sharing amongst the community and that of more of the question they're like, oh, well, I'm a paid contractor. I paid for the certification. This is amongst other paid contractors. I'll just share another really tough question. Maybe it starts a thread. That's a that's important. Like what? So then that's the first scenario. The second scenario, an entire exam is leaked. 
like the whole thing. And it shows up on one of those brain dump websites or the test prep. And the significant like signal that they saw for that was the signal within their reporting and the insights are looking on their back end and they see that the total exam completion time decreases. Like the entire time that what it was previously taking was two hours to take the full exam. And all of a sudden it went down to 45 minutes consistently. The next signal was that they went from 20 certifications a week to 200 certifications a week, issuing 200 certifications. I'm like, wait, is our marketing team like really killing it like this or, <laughs> or is something wrong? And then they found it. They, they started searching the questions and found them online. So the risk here is that like, remember at the very beginning, I said that their security levels for their technicians is really important security clearances because they have government contracts like the FBI or the Pentagon relies on these external contractors. So they say, okay, I can't trust these certified contractors anymore. I will only now use your employee level technicians. I can only allow you to send the people on your payroll to work on my stuff. These certified technology technicians, like they're cool, but I, I, I personally can't take that liability as, a, as your customer, right? So that's the scenario I would love for you guys to dive into. Like, what does Unicorn Tech Systems, what do they do now? Like, how do they fix, what, do they, what is it? What, is, what do they do now? And I, I, I want to say, I mean, just listening to you talk through those examples, I mean, those are very real. That, 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 but both of those scenarios, we encounter with clients more often than the client wishes they, they occurred. So it is very, it is very real and it can be incredibly disruptive to the certification program. I've seen some, I've seen some really great initiatives kind of come to a halt when Again, there is either or both a, a, a perceived value in being certified, or there's some high stakes reason to be for that user to be certified. So in other words, it leads them to a job or I've seen these great, great certifications come to a grinding halt for actually for both of those scenarios. So I think they're, they're spot on. I'll let Steve start. I mean, let, let's talk about solutions. I, I think everything on this slide is also real things we've seen put into place that can help. Sure. Well, and so certainly from our perspective, proctoring is a logical tool to be to be used to maintain the integrity of that assessment or that exam for all the reasons we cited earlier. But I think there, that there are probably other, other elements of a customer's processes that they may want to review just to minimize the potential for some of these exam questions or what have you to escape in the wild. So yeah. So I, I, Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that I, I don't know that there's any element of the of the process end to end that shouldn't then be scrutinized just to make sure that the the process isn't leaky in some way. No, absolutely. I mean, the, 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 interestingly, <laughs> interestingly, I sort of see proctoring as as the solution for both prevention and recovery. There are scenarios for recovery that are valid. We've seen clients do things like take the test that was leaked in its entirety, immediately turn that into a pre-test or a prep solution, add it to the study materials and quickly create a new exam. And that, that has worked well. It doesn't sort of diminish the the total investment in the original uh, exam and they get some value out of it and the answers are online. But just, I've seen them work through that really well. There's a lot you can do with questions and question volume and how you think about uh, rotating questions and, and randomizing questions. That's certainly an option as well. But honestly, I, I think there are, there are recovery benefits in proctoring as well. Meaning the investment, I think, Steve, in the entire certification when it's in jeopardy can be recovered with the, inter with the introduction of, of proctoring. And I, and I think what the, one, one of the, the key bullets here is the concept of repurposing, right? So, mm -hmm. so I would, the way that I would articulate that is, well, if you, if you have a, a formal assessment that can no longer be used, mm -hmm. well, the questions are actually still somewhat challenging. So why not use them in the context of a practice exam, right? In concert with individual users, right? Because that is something that our combined solution will allow test takers to do. Like 
mm-hmm. take the practice exam and then mm-hmm. and then it's kind of a warm up for the, the full on production exam so that's mm-hmm. a great point. And actually the marketer hat on that I'm going to put on because I never take it off is repurpose it. I think I put it on here on the slide is re- using it as a full toolkit. And once you put proctoring onto your next issue of the, like the next iterance of your oh, exam, yeah. then it becomes a marketing tool. It becomes like, Hey, we've got this whole new test prep like course, you can start doing live study sessions. You can do community moments like meetups where you're making it a a whole new moment. And it doesn't have to be like this complete breakdown and feel like a loss from top to bottom because it it can be repurposed. It can be a new way to market your certification from the beginning. It's like, okay, this is the next level. So we've issued it. It's great. Now we want to give you even more. So here's 2.0 and we're going to prepare you for it this time. So those suggestions. And again, underscore, to, I like to, to give this disclaimer as well. Underscore is not meant to say like, come here and use Intellum. And th- for this situation, come no. here, learn this concept, use Intellum and Honor Lock is the only solution. Of course, when we're not on underscore, we believe that. And we say that all the time, but the reality is like, we, we just want you to understand the value of proctoring and when it might be appropriate for mm-hmm. your education program and understand like there are solutions out there like ours, like Honor Lock that can help you solve the problems that you might be facing or could face in the future. But we're not the only ones doing these things. There are other people that are organizational education providers, well, customer education providers. And then there are other people who provide proctoring solutions, maybe not as advanced and progressive as Honor Lock, but they exist. If you are subscribed to Learning Science Weekly. It is the greatest piece of real estate on the internet, and it will be the greatest piece of email you receive every single week. It is the Intellum newsletter, and we give you all of the groundbreaking research happening in learning science and keep you up to date on all the things relative to organizational education. The reason I want to tell you is today is our 100th issue, and I'm so freaking excited because we have been doing this for over two years now. And today is our 100th issue and we have something special planned for today, but even something bigger and special planned for next week. So if you have not subscribed, please do so. I will repost that link for you and I'll send it to you all in the recap email we send on Monday with this record. But the reason I wanted to plug that is because it goes out today. So if you're not on the list, you ain't getting it till it goes on the website. And then also please follow us on LinkedIn because that's where we post all of our content. We also would love for you to connect with Honor Lock. Oh no, my slide got messed up. But yeah, so sorry. We want you to connect with Honor Lock. Steve and Allison is in the chat. She can drop their website link so you can connect with them to find out more about their solution and if it's the right fit for you. And then... Of course, we want you to connect with Greg and Steve online. On LinkedIn, they post some really great content. Steve is ramping up his content on there and Greg is always sharing really cool stuff there. So then the last piece of request that I have is to register for next year's next month's underscore. Next month, our very own education enablement guru, Jordan Hopkins, will be hosting about reimagining enablement with education. And this is going to be a really great conversation. They all are because I'm biased, but this one is going to be super fun because we're going to talk about how to enable all of the audiences internally and externally the right way with your education program. So please register for that because you are already in the Intel and platform. You can just click the little calendar button at the top that shows events and you'll be able to click register right then and there. And we try to make it very easy for you and the last piece of request I have is for you to pretty please give me your feedback. I want to know all the good things. You can share all the bad things. It's completely anonymous, but click this link and let me know how you feel about underscore this particular topic. If you, if there was something we missed or if we covered it all, let us know what you feel about underscore and how we can keep giving you the goods and making it better and better and better. Greg and Steve, final words. The floor is yours. Well, you know what? Greg is the one who's going to that cleanup. So I just want to thank the the Intellum team, thank the audience for setting aside time today because we can't get this hour back. So we hope that it was a time well spent and I am I'm just thankful to be here. That's a great great point. Final thought, I think we think that a lot of corporate education content is going to become certification. So I want you to, you can take that away and think about it, but that is the, that is going to be the overwhelming evolution of corporate education. And so if you've got a certification program today and you are proctoring, I think it's worth taking a look at 
what that experience is like for the student and looking at some of the other solutions that are out there. If you have a certification today and you're not proctoring it, I think you need to decide if it's if it's valid to proctor it or not. Pros and cons, like Steve said, to them. Con, when, one pro is that proctored exams overwhelmingly, according to the research, appear to be more valuable to the user getting the certification. Overwhelmingly, they, they will tell you that they look more, they, they, they seem to be more important. They have more value. So that's something to look at. If you're not yet doing a certification, you're thinking of consider proctoring as, a, as part of that certification. Sometimes it's valid, sometimes it's not. One warning sign I'll give you for early certification people is that you don't want to create friction just simply through a proctored exam. If the goal is to get people through the content, let's get them through the content and decide then if the certification is, is something that makes sense for, for proctoring. You don't have to rush into it. Uh, Steve and I are both really into this idea and we're happy to talk with you more. Feel free to reach out to us. We love conversation. Thank you for the time. Said just like, very much like a chief experience officer. Um, I try to I do my best. Thank you guys so much for being here. We appreciate your time on this wonderful afternoon or evening or morning, wherever you're joining us from. Again, if you have questions, you know how to reach me, chi at intellum.com. Have a great day.